All right, weekly text based Tanya. What chapter are we on? 36. 36, great, because we finished 35 last week. Before we start, we want to dedicate today's learning to a Rafur Shlema Kreva for Yeshua Leib Ben Leah Pesha. Thank you. So we are starting a new chapter. Let's just refresh our memory what chapter 35 was all about. The Alter Rebbe referred to chapter 35 as a nechama, as a comfort for the Benini. Comfort for what? What, what was the Benini distraught about? What was bothering him? He was asking a philosophical question, right? He was asking, what's the point of the type of existence, which I now realize is probably the best that I can ever strive for as a non sadic What's the point of living as a person who will constantly have an internal, an unresolved internal conflict, and the best that I can ever achieve is behavioral perfection? At best, that's, that's what I can achieve. What's the point of it? So what did the Alta Rebbe tell him? How did he comfort him? Hmm? Okay, so he told him, essentially, tzaddikim have to do the same thing. He says, why are you crying about the fact that you're not a tzaddik? Um, even the tzaddik who does have a resolved inner uh, conflict, where, as, as we learned in chapter 10, um, either the incomplete tzaddik has eradicated the animal soul, or the complete tzaddik has actually converted it into a second godly soul. But even that tzaddik who's accomplished that, um, at the end of the day, he still has to focus on action because, as we explained in chapter 35, the sensitivity of the soul, the ava vayira, the soul's love and awe of Hashem, is still only a subjective experience that the soul is having as it is. It, it beholds Hashem, it appreciates Hashem. It has feelings for Hashem, but by definition, that's two separate entities in a relationship with one another. And to become absolutely one with Hashem, actually, the only way to do it is through action. Um, so at the end of the day, for, for all of the tzaddik's great spiritual sensitivity, that doesn't allow him to become one with Hashem, it's only through action. And that's precisely what the Benini was told to pursue as well, to pursue action. Okay, so that's what we spoke about in chapter 35. Now, as we begin chapter 36, we're going to focus more on the question of why is action why is the, the soul's performance of mitzvahs in an embodied state, why is that so precious? We explained that it allows us to transcend our separateness, even the separateness of the soul, which is a lofty separateness, but a separate, separateness nonetheless. Uh, but we didn't really explain why that's what Hashem desires. Why does Hashem want this as well? Why is this so important to Hashem? So in chapter 36 we get into that. What Hashem wants, what, what Hashem is really after. Now, it may seem somewhat familiar to you from chapters 33 and 34. If you remember, in chapters 33 and 34 we already brought up the idea that Hashem wants a dwelling place in the physical world. And we spoke about how we grant him that dwelling place in the physical world through letting him into our minds and hearts when we are conscious of him through our belief in him. Um, and we called that a dwelling place in the lower realms. And relatively speaking it is, but here in chapter 36 we're going to speak about a dwelling place in the lower realms in a much different way way. We're speaking about it in the objective sense, not as something that is 
um, dependent on somebody's mindset, but actually a, 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 a real discernible change in the physical world itself. Okay, but well, let's just jump in. Chapter 36. V'hine mudazes maimerizal. It is a well-known saying of our sages. Shitachlis brias elam hazehu that the purpose, the ultimate purpose of the creation of this world, the physical world, is shinis ave that Hashem had a taiva, a lust, a yearning. Shnisave Hakodish Baruchu. Liyeslay that he should have for himself Dira Betachtainim. A dwelling in the lower realms. Okay, so that's the expression, Dira Betachtainim, a dwelling in the lower realms. The Altareb is going to jump on that term right away. Now we know for Hashem there's no such thing as above and below. What does it mean, above and below? Those are terms that finite beings use. Finite beings can only be in one place at one time. So they speak about here and there, up and down. For Hashem, there's no up and down. I don't need even just mean there's no spatial up and down. I mean even relative uh, conceptual up and down. Hashem is here, Hashem is there, Hashem is truly everywhere. So wh- why are we using this term? Because Hashem fills all worlds equally. So that's our question. What does this Dira B'tachtenim mean? But here's the explanation of the matter. Here we go. Before the creation of the world, He alone was singular and unique. And he filled the entire place where the, the future world would come into being. So there was nothing but him. And even now it is the same for him. The creation of the world didn't create any change for him from his perspective. Rather, the only change is from the subjective perspective of the created beings. That the created beings receive life from Him through various different concealments. Like it says, No man can see me and live. In other words, Inherently, there is a concealment of Hashem, or we wouldn't be able to exist. No man can see me and live. If Hashem would be revealed, if infinity would be, re- be revealed, there'd be no place for a finite entity. We'd be completely overwhelmed out of existence. <coughs> so our existence is inherently a product of concealment of the light. In fact, our sages go further and say, when it says, No man can see me and live, and live hints to the chayes, the, the angels who are called chayes, which means even the angels can't see God and live. They see a glimmer. It's like looking at a crack of light under the door. And then you get a hint of what kind of light must be in the room, but you can't go in the room because it'd be too bright. Now this is the concept of the histalshalis ho elamais, the chain-like descent, devolvement of worlds, and their descent from level to level. In other words, it is not just one concealment; it is a series. It is a system of compounding concealments. We've spoken about this before, about if you take translucent curtains and you put layers of them over the window, then it, they will eventually have the effect of being opaque. And an oilam, the word for world in Hebrew is oilam, is the, from the etymological root helim, which means concealment. A world is a concealment. It is a concealment of creator, because by virtue of seeing creation, we 
by definition, per se, our masking creator. And they, they, the, these oilamites, each one compounds the effect of the previous ones until creator is all but entirely concealed. All these different, he calls them garments, conceal the light of Hashem. Until the net result is the creation of this physical, coarse world. This is the end of the line. It couldn't get more concealed than this. Concealment after concealment after concealment, and this is the net result. This physical world. Should we go back to the beginning? Hmm. It seems familiar to you. This last time. This is chapter thirty-six. It seems familiar. I was a few minutes late. I should have said it at the beginning. I'd it, like to hear it again. <laughs> I said earlier, it might, some of it might sound familiar because in chapters 33 and 34, we, spo- we spoke about Dira B'tachtenim a little bit also. But we're going to come at it from a new angle now. Okay, so he's, c- he's continuing to describe this series of concealments. Nivra Elam Hazish, Hagash Mamish. Right. Until the net result is the creation of this physical world. <laughs> and this world is the lowest level. There is no level lower than it as far as concealment of the light and the darkness that is doubled and redoubled. This is a famous uh, expression in Chassidus Chabad. Chassidus Chabad is all based on Tanya, and there are certain phrases from Tanya which are worked and reworked and reworked over and over again. So this phrase, Hatachtein, Elam Haza Hatachtein, She'ein Tachtein Lamata Mimenu. This low physical world, lower than which there is none. There is nothing lower. There is no Tachtein, there's no lower, lower than this lowest world. In other words, you couldn't even in theory imagine more concealment than what this physical world brings about. He explains now the condition of this concealment. To such an extent that this world is full of klipa, see chapter 6 and 7. And sitra achra, again 6 and 7. Which literally oppose Hashem. Laimer saying, I exist and nothing else. Wow, what a chutzpah. So these clippers can exist in such a concealment. The ultimate purpose of the descent of the worlds, level after level. Is not for the sake of the higher worlds. Important concept. Hashem made this system we call Sedrish Dalshlis, this chain like descent of world after world after world, concealment after concealment after concealment. What is the tachlis? What is the point of it? What's it supposed to accomplish? So he says. Clearly, the point of it is not the higher worlds. Now, you might think that that's patently obvious. Obviously, the point isn't the higher worlds, because if it were, why, why didn't he stop when he had the higher worlds? Why did he keep on going? But this is an incredibly important concept. It is such an important concept that it continues to be a difficult concept for most religious Jews today to grasp. In fact, it is probably the most difficult concept for religious Dira, Jews Dira, to Dira, grasp. Dira. Not just Dira B'tachtenim, but this idea that the heavens are clearly not the ultimate point of creation. In many systems of thought, which I'm not here to negate because Elu Ve'elu Divar Elikim Chayim, and they all have validity, I'm not here to negate them, but I'm here to contextualize them. 
And many systems of thought within Toyota, I'm saying legitimate holy systems of thought within Toyota, the ultimate goal and point of it all is always framed as Gan Eden, as the afterlife of the soul. Well, that has its place, and within a certain context it makes sense, but here we're discussing <clears throat> the, the point not just of um, reward and punishment, which is a, is, a, is a concept unto itself, but we're talking more on an existential level Look, Hashem is everything. He, he, he is complete. He's perfect. And then he decides to make a world. Okay. So then not only he makes a world, but he makes a world after a world after a world. And he keeps going. He doesn't stop. It's like, okay, enough already. Like, enough. Enough concealment. No, he keeps going. He keeps going. And he doesn't stop until he has this total concealment, this, this world where you can even have opposition to Hashem. You can have denial of Hashem. So I don't yet know why he wanted that. I know that he wanted it because nothing compels him. So he clearly wanted it. I don't know why he wanted it, but I know that he wanted it. And when I say I know that he wanted it, I can be even more specific than that. I can say I know that he wanted to go that far. <coughs> and he wasn't satisfied, so to speak, until he got that far. And so therefore the point of it all isn't in heaven. The punchline to this whole thing isn't welcome to the pearly gates. It cannot be. 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 And, and I, 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 it's so frustrating because the average Orthodox Jew finds it so difficult to escape from this paradigm. And if I were to say something probably I shouldn't say, I would say it's, in my opinion, probably Christological influences. Because the Christians emphasize afterlife. That's their whole focus on, on uh, that's the end all and be all. But from a purely Jewish perspective, does it even make sense to you that the ultimate point of it all would be heaven? Does it even make sense to you? And if so, I'll just ask you a simple question for discussion and for thought and for pondering. If the ultimate point of it all is the reward in the afterlife called Gan Eden or paradise, then how come when Mashiach comes and there's the resurrection of the dead, we're going to bother those poor, comfortable souls who are blissing out in the highest levels of Gan Eden, and we're going to pull them out of there, and we're going to make them come right back down to the physical world for embodiment all over again? Rabbi? Hold on. Why would we do that? Don't ask me a new question. I'm asking you a question. I'm not asking you a new question. Hold on a second. I want you to answer my question. Why would we do that to Meishu Rabbeinu's neshama? He just had a yard set a couple days ago. He's 3,300 so many levels up in Gan Eden, and Mashiach's going to come any second now. We're going to pull him out of that. Why would we do it? It's a real question. So the reason is that the only place that we can accomplish what we need to accomplish for Hashem is here. Right. But it's already accomplished. But, but hold it, your answer is the only place where we're going to accomplish what Hashem wants us to accomplish is here. But that's what the people who are fixated on Gan Eden will also say. They'll say the only way to achieve it is down here. The only way we can accomplish is down here. I'm saying something more than that. So I'm saying something different. You say that the After the perfection of the world is already accomplished, there's nothing more to accomplish down here. You're saying that the ultimate purpose of creation is this world. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So the ultimate purpose of creation is this physical world. 100%, but, yes. But there is a caveat that you can't believe that it's just for this world. I, it's a hard concept. Right. Yeah. That's why I'm harping on it because right. it is it can't difficult. Just be for this world. Well, it can't. <laughs> you're saying it can't just be for this this physical world. I'm saying the opposite. I'm saying the, the exact opposite. It can't just be for heaven. No, it can't just be for heaven, but it has to uh, take place here 
in order to ultimate right, and that's, and destination. Okay, so that's what they will argue, they, whoever they is, okay. they will say, yeah, there needed to be a physical world, but really it's a stepping stone in order to be able to earn a higher level in Gan Eden, so the whole point was Gan Eden. But it's not a stepping stone. Did I ever tell you guys the story about my Buddhist friend, the Buddhist priest? I'm sure I did, because I tell that story all the time. My, my friend, the Buddhist priest, who was a good Jewish boy, who <clears throat> he, very quick, I'll try to tell it quickly, he um, had a PhD in philosophy from Princeton. And you know, like Yisroi, who he studied every Avedis in the world before he found Hashem? So this guy studied every of his in the world. He, and he, no, he didn't. I've told this story many times, and I said, it's not a Hollywood ending. He died, and he was cremated, and his ashes were spread in Tibet. Okay? So don't, don't, I don't, yeah, that's right, because that's what happens. Because this is the lowest world, that there's no world lower than it. That's what happens in the lowest world. That Jews die in Gullis and are cremated. That's what happens, okay? Sad. <coughs> that's the reality. But, that's not but hold on, I, let me tell you I'm telling you this story. So this good Jewish boy who was raised in Metairie, Louisiana, brilliant mind, probably the smartest person I ever met in my life. Anyways, he, um, he studied every religion, every philosophy, every ideology. He got a PhD in uh, philosophy from Princeton, and he was a man of integrity. So at one point he said, I have to follow one of these. So he chose Buddhism. I'm telling you the story very, very quickly. Anyway, so he became a Buddhist priest because when a Jew becomes a Buddhist, he can't just be a regular Buddhist, he has to be the Buddhist priest because the Jews are like everybody else, only more so. Okay. So, <clears throat> I was learning Tanya with him one day. With the Buddhist priest? Yeah. We used to, well, we had a kvias. We used to learn Tanya together every week, and I would come over to his house, and I would put on tefillin with him, and he would always tell me, there's nothing in my religion that prevents me from putting on tefillin. And I would tell him, it's okay, I wasn't worried. I wasn't, like he thought I was scared I was making him do a, an Aveda in his religion. Jewish well, and a Buddhist priest. That, that's he what I'm saying. And he went to Hebrew school, and Hebrew school did a wonderful job of, of, of convincing him that when he started on his search in earnest for a religion to live by, the first one he crossed off his list was Judaism, because he knew from... Hebrew school, how superficial and shallow Judaism was, the version that he was given in Hebrew school. So chalk one up again for American Hebrew schools. Um, at any rate, so I was learning with him, and he, in the middle of learning, all of a sudden he got all excited, and he starts saying, that's radical, that's radical, that's radical. And he wouldn't calm down, just kept saying, that's radical, that's radical. And I'm waiting for him to comment and tell me, what is radical? That's radical. That's radical. And I'm like, okay, all right. Well, what's, what's radical? He says, nobody says this. Nobody says this. Only you guys. Only you guys say this. Now, remember, I told you his background. He studied every ideology, every religion, every philosophy in the entire world. I mean, every known one. I guess there's probably some obscure religions he didn't know about. But um, he was very, very aware of every... <laughs> belief system. And he starts saying, that's radical. Nobody says this. Nobody says this. Nobody says this. So it occurs to me, I didn't even know what it was he was getting excited about, but um, that whatever he's about to tell me is really super important for me to listen to because he's about to tell me something that is uniquely Jewish and perhaps uniquely Hasidic and that I didn't even realize was so because uh, I just read it and I wasn't even sure what he was reacting to. So it's called the expert blind spot. Apparently, there was something really big, a bombshell there, and I was totally oblivious. So finally he calmed down, and I'm like, okay, what is radical? What does nobody say except for us? He says, there are people who will say that the, pheno the phenomenological universe does not exist. Phenomenological universe means the world where that engages our physical senses, the world where stuff happens. So there are those who will say that it doesn't exist. It's an illusion. There are others who say that it does exist, but it's only as a stepping stone to get to a spiritual world, which is the true existence. He says, of course, there are atheists 
who are materialists and they only believe in the physical world, but I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about spiritual belief systems that believe in spiritual worlds and believe in a creator. No one believes that there are spiritual worlds and yet the entire purpose of all can only take place in the physical world. That is radical. Nobody else says that. So that, that really hit home for me. Nobody else says that. Um, of course, as Jews, we believe in Gan Eden. Of course, we believe in an afterlife for the souls. But that's not a uniquely Jewish concept. I'm not saying we got it from them. They got it from us. But I'm saying it's not uniquely Jewish. Plenty of religious people, in fact, I would argue, by definition, all religious people, it depends how you define a religion, but all religious people believe in some spiritual afterlife, some reward for the disembodied soul. But it is uniquely Jewish to make the claim that the ultimate purpose of all can only take place in the physical world. And what is that purpose, Rabbi? Well, I don't know yet. I didn't say yet. Oh, okay. Didn't say yet. Okay. Yeah. Is there, like, a, like on a day-to-day basis, is there a difference, really, between, let's say, Mashiach and Olam A practical day-to-day difference? Yeah, I mean, 100% practical day-to-day. day-to-day difference in motivation. Right. When you have to make a decision yeah. between something that will give you a higher Gan Eden or something that will make the world a holier place, which one are you going to choose? If you have a choice to work on your own spiritual development for another minute or go out and refine the world, which one are you going to choose? I don't want to get into a, to a whole side conversation, but there's a famous story of the, the Maram Mirottenberg, who was held ransom. And uh, again, I'll tell the story very quickly. He ordered his followers not to redeem him because he didn't want the local authorities to get into the business of ransoming rabbis. Anyways, he died in imprisonment. He was held in a tower. It's a whole story. And even after he passed away, they would not release his body for Jewish burial. And then later, there was this Jew, his name was Alexander Wimfen, and he got he paid to get the body of the Maram released for Jewish burial. And after he did that, he had a dream where the Maram came to him and thanked him and said, because of what you did for me, I'm allowed to give you a reward from heaven. And they, they, they're allowing me to give you one of two, two options. You have to choose. Behind door number one is you're going to get paid back for the money you spent redeeming my body, which was a small fortune. You're going to get paid back, and not only that, but you and all of your descendants will be wealthy at Saif Kolodotis for the end of all time. Behind door number two is you're going to be on my level in the afterlife. But the catch is you have to come with me tomorrow. So he woke up, and he spoke with his wife, and he said, listen, we can be rich or I can go to heaven. Go no door number three? No, it's two options. It wasn't Monty Hall. So he's, she's like, well, what do you want to do? And he's like, well, I want, I want the heaven. And she's like, okay, go for it. So they called all the kids together, and he's like, okay, you know, Tati's going away, and he's going to a good place. And he died the next day. So you can tell, by the way, I'm telling it, by the way, I'm kind of like giving away the punchline. But the story is really a story within a story. <clears throat> Reb Hillel Paracha, the Mashpia, used to tell this story at Fabrengen's, and then he would ask everyone at the Fabrengen, so if you were Reb Alexander, which one would you choose? And typically, everyone would say, oh, I would be holy like Reb Alexander, I would take heaven, of course, I don't need money, I want spirituality. And then he would rebuke them all, and he would say, you guys are so selfish, what does anybody benefit from your going to a higher level in heaven? Take the money, you know how much good you can do in this world, you know how many people you can help with the money? But let's get back on the topic. The main topic, do you remember what the main topic is? What were we even talking about? Tanya, 36. The, 
Yeah. We're not talking about spiritual world. That's how we got off topic. Materiality, the physical world. So we're saying like this. It is logically impossible that the purpose of creation is the spiritual world. And the fact that Hashem continued creating world after world until He got to the physical world, that itself logically forces us to conclude that the purpose of creation is in that, what we call that end of the line, in the physical world. Now, we don't know why yet. You asked a good question. Why? I don't know. I, don't, I didn't learn yet. Okay. I know logically that it must be. Okay. I don't know what it is yet. Okay. All right. Yeah, I'm backing up. The purpose of the creation of the world is not for the spiritual world. Because those are just a descent. Remember, even the highest spiritual world is a descent from Hashem. But rather, the ultimate point is the physical world. Okay, now we're going to start to get into why. Well, why? Why should that be the tachlis? Okay. You know what the answer is? Because. <laughs> it really is. I mean, we're going to elaborate. But the answer is because. Shekach alabaritzenei Because that is what arose to his desire. That's what he had a craving for. He decided he wanted pickles and ice cream. Lies nachas ruch It arose to his desire that he should have nachas. He should have fulfillment. When the darkness would be subjugated and even transformed into light. That the light of the, the infinite should shine in the place of darkness, meaning the physical world. But yeser says for yeser is with greater intensity. And with the advantage of light that comes from darkness, much more than how the light shines in the spiritual worlds. That there, in the spiritual worlds, the light is diminished so that the spiritual worlds are not nullified out of, ex- out of existence. And yet, we didn't explain yet the mechanics of how, ultimately, it is only in the physical world where we can have our cake and eat it too, where Hashem can have his cake and eat it too, where there can be the ultimate revelation. It's a total inversion of our previous way of thinking. We think of the spiritual world as, as revelation and the physical world as concealment. But he says to you, hold on a second. Revelation and concealment are, 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 are relative terms. We think of the spiritual worlds as revelation because for us, oh, it's so spiritually, everything there is, is spiritually revealed. But relative to Hashem himself, to the infinity itself, the spiritual worlds are concealment. And if they wouldn't be concealment of the infinite, then the spiritual beings wouldn't be able to exist. So the spiritual worlds are concealment. Now you can say the physical world is even more concealment, but here's the, the weird concept. It's so much concealment that it comes full circle and it becomes revelation. We didn't explain yet how that works, but I, that's basically the concept. Okay, And that he says... The Alter Rebbe says that Hashem gets special nachas, he gets special joy from this, where the darkest world becomes the source of the greatest light. Okay. Now, in order for us to be able to endure that revelation without being nullified out of existence, Hashem gave us the Torah, which is called Oiz V'Kayach, strength and might. Hashem is going to give power to the righteous to endure their reward in the world to come. Meaning to say, you think it's so easy to endure the reward? The reward is so intense, it could nullify you out of existence. But Torah is the mechanism by which a finite being can encounter the infinite and not lose its own 
existence. That we will not be nullified out of existence when Hashem's light is revealed without a garment. Like it says, when Mashiach comes, your teacher, your master, meaning Hashem, will no longer be concealed from you. He will no longer be hidden with a, with a garment. Your eyes will see your master. And furthermore, it says, the prophets say, You're, You will see eye to eye with Hashem. Uchsiv, and it says, again from the prophets, The sun will no longer be your light. Hashem will be your light forever. So there will be this intense revelation in the physical world after Mashiach comes. And yet, paradoxically, we will be able to endure that intense revelation. V'neidr is known, that the era of Mashiach, the era which is the final culminating phase of history where there will be complete peace in the world, and especially the era of the resurrection of the dead, where the physical world will be so completely refined that souls from heaven will only be able to go up by coming down. That's a little paradox there. The only way for a soul in heaven to have another aliyah will not to be to go to a higher level of Gan Eden like they've been doing for, for thousands of years, but actually to come back down to the physical world because the physical world will be that refined. So it's known that those phases, Yemei Mashiach and Trias Mesim. Those are, the, those are the point, the purpose, the completion of the physical world and the purpose for which the world was created in the very beginning. Then there's another era even after that called Elif Hashvi, which is even beyond the Tachlis, that's the reward, that's another state of being even further beyond. So basically what we're describing here is that the spiritual worlds are very nice and there's a lot of spiritual revelation there. But relative to it, infinity itself, the spiritual worlds are concealment. So what's the point of them? Rather, the point is that there should be a physical world which is the ultimate concealment and that in that ultimate concealment there should become the ultimate revelation which will come about when Mashiach comes and even beyond when Mashiach comes when the dead will come back, the souls will come back into physical bodies and that the ultimate godly place holier than any heaven will be the physical world. Now in order to kind of try to wrap our minds around this, he says there's a precedent for this. He says you're trying to envision what this looks like. We do have historical precedent. He says, We have a similar, me'ain means a similar situation, at the time when the Torah was given. Like it says there, You were shown to know that Hashem is God, there is none else. Not just that you believe. I want to make them be quiet. How do we make them be quiet? Can you do it nicely? In the back? No, whoever's talking. But can you do it nicely? Don't even tell me who it is. And do it super, super nicely. Because I, I don't want to be mean to anyone. If I go over there, I'm going to come off all brash, and I don't want to do that. And then be the opposite of what we're trying to accomplish. We're trying to make the world a better place. Okay, just five more minutes here. Okay. All right. So, we said when Matan Teira occurred, when the revelation at Sinai occurred, it says, you were shown to know that Hashem is all there is. Not just you believe it conceptually as an article of faith, dogmatically, but you were shown, literally they saw it. In fact, they saw it with their physical senses. So that's a sort of sneak preview to what it's going to be like when Mashiach comes with our physical senses. It will become empirically evident that there's nothing but God. How do you like that? And by the way, as Mashiach is getting closer, 
That's what science is actually finding. Empirically, they're searching and finding that it's all one, the, the unity of matter and energy, and ultimately, they'll find the unifying theory of everything, which all the great minds are in search of, and they will find empirical evidence that it's all one. But at the time of Matan Torah, that's what happened. We had we, we physically experienced the oneness. We, you were shown with literally, he calls it ria chushes, with your physical sense of sight. Not just a, a, a knowing or an awareness, but physical sense of sight. Okay. Like it says, It says that all the nations saw the sounds. They saw what is heard. They had synesthesia. In other words, that which is normally heard, meaning that which is only hearsay, meaning spiritual phenomena, became physically visible to the naked eye, to the human being's eye. So that was, that was a sort of a sneak preview of what it's going to be like when Mashiach comes. We're going to walk outside, we're going to look around, we're going to see godliness. Not from a perspective of, oh, we're going to be so enlightened, we're going to know that it's there, we're going to appreciate it. You're going to see it empirically with your physical senses. Like it says, or we said that, and the sages say, they looked into the east and they heard the voice of God saying, I am the Lord your God. And also in all four directions, and above and below. Like the Kun Isaiah says, the less Asad the Lam Malmine Imhain Khulu, there was no direction which the voice of God did not emanate. And again, this is not talking about a subjective enlightenment. We're talking about an objective experience that you would be able you'd be able to record it with a tape recorder. It was not somebody's subjective imagination or even don't call it imagination because it makes it sound like it's false. But it wasn't just because they were super sensitive. No, it was objectively occurring in the physical world. And why was that revelation? Because Hashem's ratzin, Hashem's desire, as embodied in the Ten Commandments, was being revealed at that moment. And when that was happening, so God became revealed in the physical world. I think we're going to try to finish this chapter if we keep moving. Okay. Shehein klala satayda. And the Ten Commandments are the aggregate of the entire Torah. And the Torah is Hashem's deepest desire. And there's no concealment. We were talking about worlds. Worlds are concealment. And world after world, 